Man, how are you doing today? Well, it's a, it's a beautiful morning. I was just enjoying uh, that last presentation. Although I was going through my website, I'm like, how many links have we got? And I was like, oh, way more than seven. Oh, no. I've got like 15. I'm like looking at it. I'm like, oh. Uh, all right, we're going to do something here. So uh, thank you so much. <laughs> I was like, nope. okay. Man, what we can time improve. is it there in Australia right now, Charlie? 8.30 in the morning. Okay. All right. It's not too early, but you're probably not getting as much sleep as you'd want with a little one though too, huh? Well, uh, we're actually celebrating in this house. We've just had two, I repeat, two full night sleeps. So uh, in a row, that's almost like you really question and weigh up your values when you have like, when you don't have kids, like a a good night's sleep, it's not really worth much to you. You take it for granted. But when you haven't had them repeatedly, you start to like, would I pay a thousand dollars for a good night's sleep? (laughs) <laughs> that's where he's like can we have the babysitter stay overnight and let's go check into a hotel somewhere right just to sleep exactly. like what you st- you really really start to think about these things <laughs> but do, do you want a quick funny story i've got a quick funny yes, story for do. you yeah so we invested in uh upgrading our podcast studio we're actually halfway through it at the moment so what you're seeing right now is uh the new camera and and setup we've got here now before this call i thought i better check it Right. And I go, okay, like I haven't really used it much. I'll admit, like some of these technology has even passed my understanding. There's ISOs and white balances and F this and one in 50 that. And I'm like, right, we'll get there. And I turn everything on and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'll just check the camera. And I'm like, oh, it's black. Like there's no screen. Like what's going on? I'm, I'm reset it and I do it. I'm like, oh, geez, there's four minutes till I've got to get on this. Had the lens cap on the camera. <laughs> So uh, literally what was happening is I'll just put it on is that was over the screen and it was like, just, it was working. I just hadn't had the cap off. So uh, all panic stations before we get it, but how are you doing so far? How's, how's the live stream doing? I think the live stream is going well. Uh, I've had enough time in between little bits where people pull up slides here and there that I'll run and grab a cup of coffee or water and uh, need to run to the bathroom back, but rocking and rolling along. has been great. Honored to have you joining us from, uh, Sydney today. We've had people, India, Barbados, Canada, you, um, Italy. We started off the morning with somebody from Milan, Italy. So we've kind of run the gambit across different continents and the Caribbean as well, too. So uh, it's been good. A lot of great stuff. It's going to be, you know, this is always the first part of putting everybody together and then the work comes afterwards and what, how we repurpose it and reuse it for a variety of things and, and marketing. Um, not only just to share the message like Alex was talking about, but also really you know, find the right people, the, the right people to have the right engagement for what we're looking for. And I was honored that you're like, Hey, yes, we're glad to be on here. Cause I love what you're doing with your paid engagement and paid traffic to really identify great clients versus trying just to rely on Google or Facebook or somebody just to give you the right type of again. We all know that that's kind of gamified with their algorithms. You've really kind of been a student of your craft here the last couple months. And, and identified some great ways for marketers to really find the right people to add to their tribe or their audience, right, Charlie? Absolutely. So I'll, I'll give some context to that. We'll, we'll start with a bit of a story. Um, sure. If we're going back, let's say, uh, t- probably more than 10 years ago, um, was when I was first trying to work out, like, what am I going to do in business? Like, I was coming out of a career and I was trying to pick a business that, to do. And I, I like, thought of all that. I thought maybe eBay or Amazon. I do products. And then I was like, you know, at one point me and my wife even considered buying um, a takeaway shop, like a food shop um, because we're like, Oh, this looks cool. And then we looked at a gym and like, I was very, very overwhelmed. And there was so many options that I eventually came to this decision. And this is as much that went into it. So just be ready for this. Who doesn't like someone that can get them clients or work? Like, isn't that everyone's best friend? Like if I just work out how to get people uh, customers, we're set. Um, so again, <laughs> huge amounts of research and thinking in there, but nonetheless, that was my uh, doorway into uh, internet marketing in particular paid ads. So this is uh, quite a long way ago now. And to give you some context is like Facebook ads didn't even exist at this point. And we went headfirst into starting an agency predominantly focused on Google and eventually took up Facebook ads. We did that for about five years and um, had a whole heap of fun along the way, grew to about a team of 15. And then I think at one point we were spending about five or $6 million a year on ads for us and clients. So gained quite a lot of experience in understanding uh, how this whole internet thing and uh, mostly direct response marketing works. 
from there, I actually got acquired. I, I sold that business. So a very, very, we'll call it a happy ending. Not, not a little bit of pun in cheek there. It was in certain <laughs> sense, patiently a great finish, um, which w- was an awesome experience and completing the entrepreneurial kind of trifecta of, you know, build and maintain and sell, which was so much fun. In between, I did have another business, an outsourcing business that I, I have worked on and still work on a little bit to this day. But in more recent times, um, just my obsession with podcasting had never left me. So to give, her, again, just another little quick side story here is that uh, when I was making the decision about leaving my job and going into this, I would listen to podcasts every day to and from work, like learning these little things and like, oh my God. And I don't remember if you remember like uh, the internet marketing podcast or some of these earlier ones, which I think might still be going, but um, loved them so much. And they were hugely influential. And there was a guy called Pete Williams who had Preneurcast. So funnily, Pete lives down the road from me now and we're good friends. But um, we, we actually, like, he was one of my first, like, oh, my God, this is the internet. So um, along that journey, eventually uh, came full circle and we started Vela Media, which is what I do today, um, which is a podcast agency, essentially. We do podcast services for business. We help business owners uh, grow and create podcasts. I'll say about six months ago, we, we reached a very real challenge in the idea that some of the organic methods that had been serving us well and serving our clients well seemed to really, like, the rug kind of got pulled out from us a little bit. And I know many people have faced this. I'm I'm not going to pretend. I I know you've probably got some sensational panelists on here that have found new and interesting ways to do organic well. Um, And honestly, good on them. I didn't find them. (laughs) And my prior experiences, which is why I told that story, led me to say, I think there's some sort of bridge between these worlds. I think that um, paid traffic, particularly Facebook ads and Google ads and Twitter ads, might actually be something not enough people are exploring. And there might be some things we can do here. So we, we really got together at Vela Media and we went, went with the idea of, okay, on my own show, I always waste my own money first, or I should say spend or test. Okay. Um, I've made, <laughs> but I said, let, let's make some donations to Google and Facebook because they're really struggling right now. And let's... Um, find out or see if we can discover a way to start growing podcasts more strategically, not just faster, but more strategically. And, and to your point there, we wanted to really know that if we use the paid methods, we can be much more targeted than organic methods. Like you can't put in, all right, only show my organic posts to people 28 to 35 in this part of the USA who are interested in this or follow these other podcasts where paid, you really can. And that was an absolute game changer for us. So after the experiment on my own show, it's like one of those things. And I wonder if you've ever had one of these moments. It's like, you look, you're like, is this, is this for real? Like, what, why isn't everyone doing this? Is this, is this a glitch? Like, you kind of have one of those moments when it's like so obscure, but it's like you've, you've just discovered the matrix. Right. So for us, that was a huge monumental shift. And then we started rolling it out to uh, the clients of Alamedia. And we even have a standalone service these days just doing podcast amplification and content amplification because we think it's just such a winner for growing an audience in the, in the modern era, so to speak. Yeah, I would, I would, I love, you've, you've shared this with me before and I love the analogy. Would you rather have 10% of your 5,000 friends that might listen or you know, 5% if that's what Google or Facebook is sharing or doing spending 20 bucks to target the ideal listener when all of our friends and family members may not even be the right avatar or the right client that we're targeting, right? And you know, what you were doing and still continuing to do really and sharing, you were sharing your dream along on, on your Facebook. Like, here's what we're doing to target this. It's a it's a whole game changer. We've been testing that out since I originally heard that from you and I've seen it, it is. I mean, yes, organic is great and all awesome if you can get a lot of organic content. But we all know that those agencies are kind of tailored more so, hey, we're going to give you, we're giving you that free ride long enough. Now it's up to you to kind of spend it with us, right? There's no such thing as a free lunch or a free drink. <laughs> uh, do, do you know, it's really interesting. I have this idea, right? I, I, I completely agree with that. There is no free lunch. But I think somewhere along the way, we as business owners developed this sense of entitlement to these mm-hmm. social platforms. And it's like, just, just imagine this, you have a business, right? And I let you use it for free for a long time. So free, I'll give you everything you want. Just post it. We'll take care of it. Right. And then one day I say, you know, like I've been, I've been carrying you guys for a while. Can you, can you help a brother out? Like, you know, maybe for the usage you get and the value you get from it and the ROI you get from it, maybe like we could 
in a little bit to keep this train going, w- would anyone really be that upset? But it's like the, the idea that Facebook or Google have done it is like, no, nah, we have our rights. You cannot charge us even though your costs must be crazy to keep that thing going and stay. But how dare you charge us? How mm-hmm. dare you? And um, I just think it's ludicrous. And I don't know about you, but it's like I tend to favor the people that pay me. So it's like, you know, if a client who pays me asks for a podcast to be done, no worries, we'll do it. That's what we do. But if someone I don't know goes, hey, I want that free podcast, probably not going to do it. So I struggle to see the rationality a lot of people fall into with this. And I'm going to say a sense of entitlement in a lot of cases of like, you know, what social media should be doing for them when I think that, um, we should all be paying them in all honesty. Like I, I really do. I think it would be better. Well, I, I agree with that. And I think especially those that are willing to do the extra is what stands out more so than anything else. So yeah, those that everybody loves the free trials of things. But I think if you look at some, especially some of the podcasting platforms or services that have been trying to do the free services, they've gone the route with like, Hey, we got to start charging. Otherwise we're in a, a no win business model. If you give everything, every, everything away for free, things don't happen as fast as we would like them to do, right? Absolutely. And I, I completely look at that. I don't know if anyone's ever paid for server upkeep or done anything with SaaS or, or anything like that, but it is expensive and constantly needs to be upgraded and maintained. And there's a whole ton of things that become obsolete and it, right. it's not a cheap game to look after in general. And it's like, I'd love to know like really down to the nitty gritty about what it costs them. But um, nonetheless, he's like, I, I just look at it and go, based on that, he's like, I'd rather just get ahead of the curve. Like, there's a fantastic offering available here. Hey, we can get hyper-targeted in whoever you want to reach. We can find the exact person who has your problem that you want to solve. And for a fee, we can put you in front of them. And I'm like, awesome, let's do that. Like, that's the philosophy I take to this. And um, it's working very well for us. It's something I really encourage. And it lights me up when I hear, like, I, I very much try and get the message out there. It's like, guys podcasts and ads it's on like get, get on board and when i hear comments from yours like yes i'm having a little go here and we're liking what we see it, it lights me up because i think a lot of podcasters are sitting there particularly struggling with this topic of growth when it's like it doesn't need to be that way mm-hmm. and then i think it, 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 we talked about entitlement too I, I like to say that there's kind of two avenues you got people that want to start a podcast and people that have actually done a podcast okay because every event I go to, it's always to make sure, oh, I'm going to start a podcast. I'm going to do it. I'm like, get off your ass and do it. Hit the record <laughs> button. That's the first thing. All right. But then you have the podcasting community, people that kind of fall into two things. One, they're trying to do everything on a shoestring budget, or they don't want to do it, put any type of investment into it, but they want a million downloads. They want a $100 million contract like Joe Rogan. And those that do take it seriously, like, hey, I've, it's, it's another business tool of marketing. I've got to put some money into it. For it to come back you got to spend some money to make some money when it comes to that right oh definitely i and don't get me wrong i'm thrilled when people like joe have been really successful and like i love those stories i yep. really do it lighting up for the future of podcasting but again this is one of those things where it's like i think the perception of how things were maybe 10 years ago where or even five years ago where there were just so few podcasts that getting an audience was very achievable i just think those days are gone so trying to win based on the rules of yesterday is probably a, a not an idea that's going to serve your business very well. Yeah. Now, when you're sitting down with somebody who's, who's thinking about putting a podcast together or doing stuff, what's kind of the aspect and the things that maybe you're looking at to identify if there is a need for that, or they're just going to be a, you know, well, like the world doesn't need another entrepreneurship podcast. We've got a million of them out there, right? <laughs> I had a plan for this afternoon. <laughs> Now, do you know what my favorite one is? is when someone comes and pitches me an idea that is the Joe Rogan podcast. And I'm like, you realize this has been done before, yeah? <laughs> uh, no, um, so, but that's a really good thing. So predominantly who we work with is experts. So people that might be authors, course creators, um, already have maybe a big email list. Hobby niches is, is another one we work a lot with, but people who perceivably know a lot on a topic or are on their way to knowing a lot on a topic is really who we work with. We don't do celebrity shows um, or anything like that. Now, the first thing I really say to people is before, like, surprisingly, a lot of the tactics work. Like this social media thing, right? It works. There's people out there having success with it. 
yet if you speak to a lot of business owners, a lot of them are having a really hard time and, and they're failing with it. And it comes back to something you just touched on there, where it's like the idea being is that before you worry about any of these tactics or ads or anything, there's two things we really want to know about is like, you know, one is niche. Like how can we serve people that are underserved? And then two is unique content. Like how can we make content where it's even if there is things in this space, you're going to stand out so uniquely that people will want to um, gravitate towards your show. Because if you can nail those two, right? Great niche and then unique value driven content. You can pick almost any promotion way of going about promotion and it, it works really well. And if you do ads mixed with that combo, it's like petrol on a fire. Like it's just, it's just crazy. You've got to be careful. You don't burn yourself. Well, and that's the thing is you've got to stand out and try to find that USP, you know, as they say, that unique selling proposition, just being yourself. That's a little, that's different than what your competition, you don't want to be exactly like your competition. I mean, there's a few other people in my note space, you know, distressed debt space out there, but what we found that worked well is, Hey, Oh, we do a podcast. Not many people have done that or doing an online event is different and helps us kind of separate ourselves from the competition and it adds a lot of value to it. Uh, I think a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, small business owners, not only a try to do it all themselves, and try, oh, we can learn that. We'll figure it out as we go. And you're just end up burning money in this hole that you don't have any expertise in, right? Oh, totally. Again, this is just one of those like legacy things that comes on is like, you know, once upon a time, I'm sure it was good advice to build your own website, do your own SEO, run your own ads, do your own podcast. Like I actually believe it was sound um, because it was a more simple space. And, and much like your previous guest said, is like it's we are in the land of specialists. We really mm -hmm. are. And I look at right now, we've got 20 plus people at Valor Media just doing podcasts. And I look at what someone would need to have in their own business to replicate what we do. And I go, and there's no way that's viable. There's no way that's profitable. Like it makes no rational sense at all for you to be sitting there trying to attempt to build the infrastructure that we have for yourself when you've got a completely different business. So I think we're moving into this era where it's like, you really need to be better at identifying the specialists you want to work with and uh, really using and leveraging the infrastructure experience and they have so you can go much faster and focus on the core competencies of your business. Mm, it is definitely not a vanilla ice cream economy anymore. You've got to be that specialized flavor, not just 32 flavors, but a million different flavors out there for you. <laughs> now I want ice cream. <laughs> Like, obviously, I'm uh, heavily biased, and I'm for ice cream this early in the morning, just while we're, we're for that. I'm, a, I'm quite an ice cream fan myself. <laughs> but when you, wait, when you run out of creamer, it makes good creamer for your coffee, by the way. <laughs> Do you know, I once had this idea. I went through a dark chocolate phase of, like, I'll put a square of dark chocolate in my coffee and, and see how that goes. It was terrible. Wouldn't really recommend it. It, it just didn't work in the way I had envisioned <laughs> at all. That's a hell of an idea if you can make it work. <laughs> oh, I, was like, I wouldn't mind a bit of that. Um, and, <laughs> to your point there. But um, no, I, I, I much agree with that. Like I, I'm very biased towards uh, podcasts and paid traffic, but I will acknowledge like I'm sure there's plenty of people who have been on here that have found different paths that are working for them. And like, you know, maybe that's a path that can suit your business, but um, I'm certainly in favor of what we we are doing. And I, I think it's certainly a viable option for a lot of business opens. Now, with you running uh, Valor Media, and I want to throw this, I, you and I have not talked about what I'm about to ask you here before, but with there being a million plus podcasts out there, I think you and I both agree there's maybe only a third of them that are actually creating stuff on a regular basis, maybe a little bit more. Um, there's, I think there's a lot of opportunity in these, the dead carcasses of the, the podcasts that have faded, that aren't being produced, whether it's websites, social media handles, uh, other things out there. Are you guys looking at any of that stuff as potential ways to buy an old podcast subscription that would probably sell some subscribers for a new podcast kind of help us to prime the pump a little bit or looking at, um, you know, we, I've looked at a, a little bit of that, but I was curious if you guys are looking at something like that to help your existing clients buy, and I don't want to say buying followers, but you kind of are if they're still subscribed on their phones, you know? This is such an interesting topic. I don't think I've ever even shared anything about what I'm going to say here. Um, 
So to your point, we see the same thing. It's about a third of the podcasts that are registered are actually active. Uh, Apple's release on Pod News was that there was 900,000 podcasts registered with Apple now. We suspect about 300,000 of them are active still. And I think to be active, you have to publish once a month to be classified as active um, from what I remember from there. But to your point, like a lot of podcasts uh, go into pod fade and it might happen early, it might happen late, it might happen for a variety of reasons, but you know, people have spent time building an asset and then they just leave it <laughs> or they don't do anything with it. Now there's this perfect moment, if you were able to capture someone right as they hit pod fade where they've still got some brand equity, that if you were able to say, buy the show, transition the show, do something with it. It could be an incredibly big shortcut and great asset. It really could. So we've, we've spoken about the idea of like, how do we capture the people going into pod fade? Like, how do you start to think about, should I be following shows in my niche? And if someone doesn't publish for a few weeks, go, Hey, I just noticed you've missed a few here. Like what's going on with this podcast? Are you, are you, are you okay? Like, do you want to transition it out? And then another thing we've really spoken about is if we were having those conversations is like, why did they pod fade? Because for example, if their reason for pod fading was that they didn't have the resources to actually deliver the show well, we would actually just go, well, hey, we've actually got an opportunity here to maybe partner with you on the show and leverage the assets or, or do some things with it. So I really think if you're a podcaster that's got the infrastructure of ways to do that, buying shows or partnering with shows that do have a bit of pod fade going on is a very viable way to go about things. The only thing I'd really be um, cautious of, it's, it's much like buying an email list in a degree as well as like they're not your subscribers um, in the same way. And it's like, if they haven't been contacted or spoken to for a few years, I'm not sure it'd probably be worth anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 the stuff that we've seen has been minimal as far as offerings up, you know, 500 to a thousand bucks, you know, it just depends. Now some people that have got a lot of episodes that have pod fed, they think their stuff is worth more, but I'm like, okay, what is it really to you? What are you paying for hosting on an annual basis that you're just kind of pissing away if you're not doing anything to, to leverage that content? And so I agree. You got to look at kind of the, uh, what if, what, and if, you know, those URLs are worth something. I mean, there's sometimes you can find some pretty decent, URLs or websites that have some value that somebody has that you can pick up and then flip if you need to. But uh, it, I think it all comes down to what's, what's been going on with that show. I think you got to go back and listen to it and figure out if they are value or similar audiences or not. And that just takes a lot of extra work sometimes when launching a brand new thing might be even be easier, huh? Absolutely. And I'll give you one more thing to consider here. You kind of hinted on it. One of my good friends has a podcast in the buying and selling websites space. Um, and he's a great guy, great space to be in if you understand it. Not, not necessarily my primary understanding, like I understand a lot about digital, but one of the things um, he's often mentioned to me was that if you had a good podcast, you could be buying sites that have the audience and leveraging existing SEO and using them as distribution rather than accompanied shows, which I think is a truly unique, probably a harder strategy to execute. But if you, for example, could buy sites that already have great rankings or anything like that, it could be very powerful. Mm. That's true. Cause I've got some friends that own websites that just generate cash for them because they're basically affiliates or lead magnets for other, uh, I got a buddy who has a credit card website in education. He basically gets a hit. Anybody signs up for a credit card on his website and millions of miles every year from just that aspect of loan. So finding stuff that has that intrinsic value. Yeah. I think there's some opportunity there. Just got to get to spend some time researching and going and, and knocking on virtual doors to make it happen. Huh, Charlie? Usually so. Yeah. What, uh, where are you seeing uh, podcasters and marketers make the biggest mistake besides trying to do their own social media? What do you see kind of on the podcasting side where they're just like, you're like, no, that's, don't do that. Shame on you. Do this instead. Um, I think a couple of things have kind of happened in, in recent times that um, I'll go through. And there's probably a few here is like one confusing um, making noise with high value content. I, I really think that there's a idea like I go through and I was scrolling through LinkedIn only because of you, by the way. You asked for my LinkedIn handle and we connected. Well, I haven't been on this thing in ages. Let's have a little look. You got a different and, photo uh, in there. I, re I recognize I cracked up. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting thing. And I'm not, it's not just LinkedIn. I'm not going to say this is the one, but I look at majority of the posts I see and it's like, it's just noise. 
Like it really is not actually like I, even if I was your ideal customer, I don't think you're actually doing he- anything here to actually bring me closer to working with you, offering any value. Like it's like subtle brags or irrelevant stuff or views that don't necessarily bring. And if the goal is to use social media as a tool to benefit our business, you failed. And that's what I kind of look at it from there. So I think that's a really confusing thing. The second thing, particularly with podcast is one of the things I, I notice as well is like, I think being too wide, like I think only publishing on one social channel is a real issue. So if you just published on Facebook, I'll just use as the example and you didn't use any of the others, I think that's a mistake. But at the other side, if you're going to do a shitty job posting on all of them, I think that's a, a really big mistake as well. So for a lot of people, I say like the rule of two, you want to, um, if you have a podcast that comes out once a week, so this is your cadence once a week podcast, you want to publish well on two platforms twice a week for the same episode in two different styles. So do a video for one post and an image for the other, do a long written one for one and do a short for the other. Like that type of flow will work well. And then also email your list twice. And then once you've got that baseline in, you've got that in and you're doing that well, then you can think about a third. But until you hit that point, really don't go past it. And to be honest, I think people like, there's some delusion that it's like, oh, well, we've maxed out Facebook. We, we need more platforms. I'm like, Pro- probably not. <laughs> it's like, maybe not, maybe. So it's like, I, I generally think that for most business owners and podcasts, there's probably two platforms that suit your audience the best. Like go deeper, do ads, do organic, like do different styles of posts, spend more in being better at those platforms of the two. Again, not one, but two, instead of trying to spread it too thin. Mm, that's so true out there. But we did a, uh, yeah, having the two platforms is not overkill because not everybody's your listener. Um, and I like what you said about if you're doing the video and then the image stuff of their video, I, I think it's so huge. And I think a lot of podcasters drop the ball by not having the video aspect to what their show is. I think you would agree to that too, huh, Charlie? Where, again, once again, biased, like most of our shows, we look after our video podcast these days. And I, I, I really like to think about like Wayne Gretzky's whole notion of like, you know, skate to where the puck is going, not to where um, it is. And if you just look at it right now, is like anyone denying that video has become a big deal? Like, or is it going to get bigger? So if you're a podcaster and you want to take advantage of these other platforms, really you need to um, get on board with these new ideas. Like there's a lot of awesome uh, advantages to doing so and like one of the big reasons like i used to just use a crappy little webcam we've just spent all the money on black magic gear and sony cameras because we know this is where it's going and being on this edge is one of the things that's going to give us an advantage in this space and then also very favorable for social and social ads yeah you definitely want to look good you just got to make sure to take the the cap off the camera to make sure it's not <laughs> because <laughs> they did i noticed uh, you're like oh just got the new camera hooked up there that's awesome <laughs> out there charlie what's the uh the best way for people to connect with you to follow you see what you're doing and, and or reach out to you to see about uh taking on their podcast and, and helping them take their, their their show to a different level yeah awesome so best place to go is the website so much like your previous guest is like we do definitely like to take people to our website although we have 15 links um <laughs> So valormedia.com is the place where we keep all our information. If you go to the resources page, particularly, I've made a bunch of frameworks and templates and everything else there that are very useful for people that are in the podcasting space. We also have my podcast, The Business of Podcasting. So if anyone's interested in doing deep dives, Scott's been a guest, a gracious guest uh, on there, sharing a whole bunch of wisdom from other podcasters as well. Um, And then finally, if someone's like, well, I've got this podcast or I'm thinking about doing a podcast and they want us to do an audit before they make next moves, we do that as well. So you can get your show audited and we'll go through it and give some useful insights for it to have a bigger impact. Mm, I love that, Charlie. And uh, congratulations on the second night in a row of a full eight hours of sleep. I know it's valuable. Loving. <laughs> punch through a wall. I've got, I'm like this much enhanced. You're, at the like, you're like on crack. You feel like you're so enthusiastic making things happen, huh? That's the day. It's the day. That's the good stuff, man. Well, hey, man, thanks for coming out and making – uh, an international flair to social media day. Uh, look forward to you guys. If you want to check out, like I said, the, the business of podcast that he has, you can also check out his interview on our Wednesday night, mass media mastermind by going to mass media mastermind.com and checking out the replay there. Uh, Charlie, as always, thanks for delivering and thanks for being present. Have a great rest of your day. All right, brother. 
Thank you so much, Scott. Enjoy and hand over. You're, you're on, Russ. Have a nice time. <laughs> Third time's a charm. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>